to the Spring Hill Broadcast. I'm Pastor T, and I am so glad and excited to have you here joining us in worship. No matter if you're joining us from somewhere else around the Gainesville region, somewhere else in the state of Florida, outside the state of Florida, or maybe somewhere else around the world, we are excited and glad to have you with us. Please do me this favor, hit a thumbs up and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us from, whether it is our YouTube channel, or if you're joining us on the springhillgnb.org website, let us know that you are here. Let's interact, let's engage together uh, so that we can share in this online moment of worship uh, and celebrate the Lord Jesus and uh, study through his word together. Uh, the word of God says, I love the Lord uh, because he has inclined his ear unto my petitions. Friends, we are grateful that we have a God that can hear and answers our prayers. Let us pray together. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. We love you, and we appreciate you for who you are, not just the things that you do, but for who you are, your holiness, your righteousness, your omnipotence, your omniscience, your omnipresence, God. We love you for who you are. Thank you for being our God and for watching over us uh, when we need you. Father, we're praying in Jesus' name that as we study the word, that you touch our hearts and our minds, quiet our spirits, from all the stresses, cares, and burdens of this life and help us to focus on you, Heavenly Father, and on your word. We pray that your word opens our hearts and minds and we pray that your word transforms us into the image and maturity of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are your servant's prayers in Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you so much for joining us for the uh, Word and Worship, our Bible study uh, session tonight. Hey, do this favor for me also. If you haven't hit share, please share on uh, the platforms that you're on. Uh, as well as maybe uh, put a link and uh, send a, a message to uh, someone via text message. Hey, maybe someone that hasn't joined us uh, on, on Sunday morning or maybe someone that's a part of the Spring Hill family that hasn't been in church in a long time because of COVID. Hey, send them a message and let them know that the, the word of God is going forward and we should study together. On last Sunday, we looked at uh, what is called the Great Commission, what is known in Christian circles and the Christian community as Christ's Great Commission given to the local New Testament church. The Great Commission comes in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Uh, the word of God says, I love the Lord Jesus and I love his word. In his word in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Always remember that in worship, we look to see Jesus. And if we see Jesus clearly, if our hearts and minds are truly focused upon Jesus, then guess what? We will naturally be inclined to worship him. And uh, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. There will always be uh, looky-loos, those that look, uh, but who are not persuaded. There will be Agrippas and Thomases in our midst all the time. Agrippa, uh, when Paul presented the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, his only objection was, I was almost persuaded, or would you persuade me so quickly? He couldn't object to the facts, but he didn't want to accept the facts. He ascended intellectually to the facts, but he couldn't open his heart to the facts. And there are many that are in that position. And uh, verse 18 says, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all power, that is all authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth as a, as a great a potentate, as a great king or ruler. Uh, he came as a suffering servant, died on the cross, was buried and three days later raised up. And at that point when he was raised, he assumes uh, the role that uh, we always knew that he would take and that is of a great royal king. And this is the statement that he makes that he has all, all authority, but not just on earth. That's what the uh, Jewish people were looking for at that time, a king that would restore the, the Davidic kingdom on earth. But Jesus came not to just rule on earth, but to rule earth and heaven. Verse 19 is where we'll focus in tonight because there were some things there that I didn't get a chance to share on Sunday. Uh, it was just not enough time and not enough runway to do it. Verse 19, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, or lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God in Christ's great commission that he gives to the local church. Remember the local church is God's vehicle and messenger of his salvation to be shared throughout all the world. I continue to try to advocate and try to expose the truth of the scriptures to you all that despite what uh, has happened and how uh, many people have tried to corrupt, how many people have tried to 
pull the church in different directions, corrupt the mission and message of the church. The truth is, in its purest form, the church is the bride of Christ that Christ died for. And you should never let anyone talk bad about the church because the church of, of the Lord Jesus Christ is his bride. And he said, not Pastor Taylor, but Jesus said upon this rock, Peter's great declaration of truth when he says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus, in response to that, says uh, upon this rock, this profession and statement of faith, I will build, listen, my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Paul, in his farewell address to the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, I think it is verse 28, says, take heed, therefore, of yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Christ died for the church. And so this modern culture that is against institutions, that is against structures, that is against authority, this rebellious spirit of the land wants to also neutralize and put the church to the side. But the problem with that is it is theologically unsound. No Bible believing Christian can ever say, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in the church. I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in going and being a part of the fellowship of believers and activating and using my gift among the body of Christ and with the believers in Christ. No true Christian can do that. And yes, I'm saying that emphatically in a world where we believe in postmodern thought, where we believe uh, whatever you think and whatever you feel is, is okay as long as that's what you feel. No, friend, there are black and whites. There are right and wrongs. And I'm saying to you, theologically, it is wrong to say, I love Jesus, but I don't care for the church. That's like walking up to me and saying, I like you, Pastor Taylor, but I don't like Courtney. Uh, that's my wife and we are one. So you, you can't uh, expect me to be okay with that. Well, so it is with Jesus. You can't tell Jesus, I love you, Jesus, but I don't care anything about your bride. He died for the church. And so here in this text, we see that he gives the mandate. He gives the orders, not to just spiritual people uh, who are spiritual, but not religious, no friend. He gives the mandate to the believers in him to the disciples, which is a gathered together group that has come together to carry out his business. And he gives them the charge and the orders. And remember, I told you, on, we shared as we studied on Sunday, there are five things that every local New Testament church uh, needs to be uh, focused on. Only five things that the local New Testament church needs to be focused on. That's worship, that is, excuse me, that is membership, that is magnification, that is ministry, that is missions, and that is maturity. Those are the five things that we are to be focused on. Here in verses 19 and 20, I want to dive in though, and there's some theological and doctrinal truths that I want to point out. Number one, I want you to see in verse number eight, again, he says, go ye, therefore, it is a present participle that everywhere you're going or as you're going, as you're going throughout your daily walk and daily life, you should be teaching all nations. We should be reaching the world basically for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the challenge that we have is that we have become so uh, consumer centric and consumer driven as so, uh, as Christian believers that we have looked at the church uh, and we have looked at our faith in Christ rather. Let's go beyond the church, but we've looked at our faith in Christ from a consumer mentality of what I get out of it, what I gain from it, what it gives me. And Christ has already done enough that if he doesn't give you anything else, he gave his hands to the nails. He gave his side to the spear. He gave his feet to the spikes. He gave his head to the thorns. He gave his life in order to purchase and pay for our salvation and cancel the sin debt. He's given us quite a bit when he gave us salvation. And so we, we but we still want more, more, more. We're never satisfied. And so we're always looking to get, get, get. But we never think about, well, God has given me so much. He's entrusted me with so many gifts. He's given me talent. He's given me energy. He's given me time. He's given me ability. What am I doing that I can introduce others to the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a concept that never uh, dawns on many people and never darkens their mind. And I think because many of us go through different struggles and strains in life that we focus so much on the problems that we have that we, we don't realize that many of our problems will always be existent, but many of them will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. If we would turn our eyes, as the hymn writer says, upon Jesus, and if we would merely point more people to Jesus, for he is the only answer 
for, for the problems that we suffer with. And so as we are going, we should teach all nations. Now, here's the challenge that we have with that. Many of us, especially in the context in which I uh, serve and, and, and uh, engage with many people, many people have a challenge in thinking about reaching the nations for Christ because we haven't even first learned how to reach our family for Christ. And that's a major challenge. How can we talk about reaching the nations when many of us aren't reaching our sons, our daughters, our nieces, our nephews? We, we, we don't even know how to do that. And so that's an indictment. Acts chapter one, verse number eight, is uh, a, a scripture that comes alongside this and I want you to know it. Acts chapter one, verse number eight, uh, Jesus is giving a farewell address just before he uh, ascends and goes back into heaven. Turn there in your passage of the scripture, Acts chapter one, verse number eight. Uh, Jesus says to them, uh, let me grab verse seven. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father has put in his own control uh, or power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me or be my witnesses both in Jerusalem. That's local missions and Judea. That's regional missionary work. And in Samaria, that's reaching those whom you would never uh, normally cross paths with. Remember, they hated the Samaritans because the Samaritans, in their estimation, were a half-breed group of people. Uh, they were a group of Jewish people that fell in love with the Assyrians, their captors, and uh, they intermarried with them and they created what is called the Samaritan race. And these Orthodox Jews despised the Samaritans. But he says people that you normally wouldn't engage with, you need to share the gospel with them as well. But don't just stop there. Go unto the uttermost parts of the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and peoples, we should be looking to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, introducing people to the message and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mission of the local church, that we have a local impact with a global outreach. May I say it again, Spring Hill is a church that has a local impact, but we are looking for a global outreach, and that is to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that tell the world that there is a savior and there is an answer for their challenges. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus gives the command, go into all the nations uh, everywhere, every nation, tribe and tongue. And that also, again, I did take time to point out then that means that our prejudices, our biases, our hangups need to be done away with. We can no longer look at people based on the color of their skin, based on their social status, their, uh, uh, their educational status and all these other barriers that we try to raise up. We need to figure out how to be all things to all men and figure out how do we get past ourselves and get the gospel to the hearts of every man and every woman, every boy, every girl, uh, everyone that needs to hear the gospel. But friend, again, I stress, we must first press ourselves to spread the gospel uh, even to our own family members. Acts chapter eight, verse number one is a very instructive passage of scripture. Acts chapter eight, Verse number one. So what happened uh, from Acts chapter one through uh, Acts chapter number eight, uh, they were stuck in Jerusalem. Uh, as a matter of fact, as Jesus is taken away, verse number nine in Acts chapter one, verse number nine says uh, that while he was taken away from them on a cloud, two men in white apparel stood beside them, beside the disciples and said, why stand ye gazing up into heaven for this same Jesus, which was taken from you, shall return in like manner. Jesus is coming again, they say. And, and although they know Jesus is coming again, what are they doing? Standing around doing nothing, just looking up. And friend, I, I preached a sermon years ago and it's still true today. Matter of fact, that sermon is over 20 years old and I'm proud to say it's been plagiarized by some preachers I saw on the internet. A guy that uh, heard me preach it in a pastor's conference, he told me that day, he said, you're gonna hear that sermon again. Matter of fact, a couple guys told me that. And uh, I was looking on, on uh, YouTube one day and the man was preaching my exact sermon Word for word, word for word, but I was flattered by that. That's fine. If he can use it, to God be the glory. Uh, but that sermon was titled out of Acts chapter one, the church is still gazing. The church is still gazing. We're unmotivated uh, by the commission, unmoved by the crisis and unprepared for the coming Christ. And that's still true today. We're still having arguments and still uh, uh, chasing ourselves like a dog chasing his tail, just going around in circles, talking about stuff that matters not talking or having arguments and discussions within church circles that make no difference to the non-believing person uh, across the street and definitely not across the globe. And so uh, that's the, the issue that they got caught up in, in between Acts chapter one through Acts chapter eight. 
They got stuck in Jerusalem. They could not see God's movement and see God's providence moving to the Gentiles and, and to all the world. And so what did God do? In Acts chapter 8, verse number 1, the Bible says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, meaning deacon Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, uh, except the apostles. Watch it. A great persecution, verse number 1, fell on the church, and they were all scattered abroad. What happened? Because they refused to go, God pushed them and made them go. Sounds a lot like what happened in March 2020 when COVID began sweeping the entire nation and when we had to do what uh, many of us went kicking and screaming to do uh, when we implemented here at the Spring Hill Church several years ago called the church has left the building. They had gotten so used to being in Jerusalem. They had gotten so used to to just being amongst their people that they forgot that there was a world out there to reach. And so it is in the local New Testament church. We're so used to being in the building. We were so used to being uh, in the four consecrated walls that we forgot that there was a life to live and that there was a world to reach for Jesus. I said that we went kicking and screaming because in 2013, although it sounds second nature to us now, when uh, we announced that uh, we were not gonna have church, regular church service on a Sunday morning, but we were gonna go and be the church, wow. There were so many people that were uh, just did not understand and were resistant. But guess what? Even those that were resistant uh, when they uh, went and served, they caught the bug and got excited and got on fire for winning souls. And they found out that when you go and share the love of Jesus, that it does more for you than it does for others, that it just it sets your heart ablaze. And friend, I'm so grateful to God for for those that continue to have that heart's passion in our church, that continue to want to just get out there and spread the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because guess what? God is doing great things in the building, but he does amazing things with us when we get outside of the building. And so we, we want to go into all the world and reach uh, people for Jesus. But then uh, verse 19, there's another thing I want to share with you, and it's, it's what he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so um, baptism is something that's uh, often misunderstood. But when he says go into all the world, uh, into all nations, he, he means to spread and share the gospel. The natural inclination, the natural thing that comes after the gospel has been spread and received is the ordinance. There are only two ordinances that Jesus left, two things that he said for uh, the church to do as memorial symbols. Uh, there were several that were given to Israel, but only two that were given for us. And that was the Lord's Supper. That was the, the supper meal that he, he took the Passover meal and turned it into the Lord's Supper meal for the local New Testament church. But then the second was baptizement or baptizing. That's what he says here, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now understand this, that baptism only comes after the gospel has been spread, and baptism only comes after the gospel has been spread and received, and not only received, but accepted as the only hope of salvation. Once a person says, I have trusted in Jesus, I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and I want to make him my pathway, my only hope of salvation, my only avenue by which to get to heaven, then the identifier that happens, not the, not the transformation that happens, but the identification of that transformation and the identifier as a believer is baptism. For the, for the Jew, the identifier was, was several things. Uh, one, uh, those that were men uh, uh, from the, the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would take on circumcision. And that became an issue in the local New Testament church uh, over in Galatians. You hear Paul have to push back on some of the Judaizers and the, and the uh, Christians that were part of the, the Jewish Christians that were part of the early church said, well, if you're going to be a good believer in God, you've got to have circumcision. And Paul said, wait a minute, that's not one of the things that Jesus left us. But baptism is. In Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, there's an interesting story, since you're already there. There's a story about uh, Philip, one of the disciples, that is, is led by the Spirit to go and meet with a, a man who is called an Ethiopian eunuch. So for those that uh, say, you know, there were no black Christians in the Bible, well, guess what? Here, here you, you run across one. He's, he's from Ethiopia. He's from the continent of Africa. He has been in Jerusalem for a religious feast ceremony observance, uh, probably the feast of uh, Pentecost. It was uh, during that time or, or one of the other feasts uh, that he had been there in the city for the celebration. And in Acts chapter 26, the spirit leads uh, Philip to go and meet with him. The Ethiopian eunuch is in a chariot and he has a very expensive 
a scroll that contains all of the Old Testament. It contains the books of Moses, the books of David or the Psalms and the prophetical books. And he's reading through it. Philip comes alongside and asks him, do you understand what you read? And friend, that's the challenge that that many of us um, need to be able to, to do. And that is give an answer, as Peter says, to everyone of the hope that lies within. We should be studying our word so that when non-believers are have questions that we too can share what the word says. But the truth is many of us are ill equipped and not ready to share the word. And so that's why a lot of times we don't want to share our faith. We don't want to talk to people about Christ is because we can't teach what we don't know. But let me ask you this question. You've been a Christian for 15 years now. Why can't you answer the questions? You, you've been a believer. You've been in church 20 years. Why can't you give someone a few scriptures that guides them and helps them understand the faith? You've been a Christian all this time. What, what are we doing? We need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen and workwomen that need not be ashamed, knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. I shouldn't be the only one that can answer a question about the faith. Those that have been studying and disciples of Jesus should be digging in the word so that we grow in our faith personally, but also we can share it with our children. We can share it with our grandchildren that we can teach them and raise them up in the word of God. In, in Acts chapter eight, verse 35, the Bible says that Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. Watch that at the same scripture. Uh, the Ethiopian unit was reading out of Isaiah where Isaiah uh, was talking about him being led as a lamb to the slaughter. And, um, uh, and, and says to him and preached unto him, Jesus, the scriptures that he was given was not New Testament. It was Old Testament. But Jesus walks across every page of the Old Testament. That's what you need to understand is that Jesus is not just in the New Testament. Uh, the truth about him is concealed in the Old Testament. And uh, they just didn't understand it. So he, he preaches to him, Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, there is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, listen to this. If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Listen, baptism didn't save him. It was his belief in Jesus Christ as the son of God. Romans 10, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. Now, the reason I'm teaching you this is because there is what we call the baptismal regeneration heresy, the baptismal regeneration heresy. There are people that believe you only get saved once you get baptized. Namely among them are the Campbellites or the group we know today as the Church of Christ. They believe that you're only saved if you get baptized and specifically get baptized in the name of Jesus, because that's what Peter says in several passages here in the book of Acts. But here's the problem, friend. I have baptized too many people uh, as adults who got baptized as children because it was the thing to do, but they hadn't believed it in their heart. And so now that they were older, now that they understand, now that they believe, now that they have been listening to the scriptures and have been taught in the scriptures, they say, hey, I want to do this as a believer. That's why at Spring Hill we call it believer's baptism. It's not baby baptism. It's believer's baptism. The reason we don't baptize babies here because a baby can't say what the Ethiopian eunuch said. He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. A little Six month old baby can't do that. So that's why we don't baptize babies here. Little children who don't understand. We don't baptize them here until you get to an age where you know and can understand and make it a choice, not in your head, but in your heart. There are a lot of people that have ascended intellectually to the facts. They know it in their head, but they haven't received it in their hearts. That gets into a whole nother conversation. The Campbellites, the Church of Christ I was talking about, uh, started by uh, Alexander and Thomas Campbell, who were two former Baptist preachers who got caught up down this rabbit hole in the book of Acts. They got so caught up on baptism that they just didn't understand. Baptism does not save anybody. You can go down wet and come up wet and still never be saved. And, un and, and notice this, that there was sufficient water. So that meant the, the eunuch, he had a bottle of water 
but he didn't get it poured on his head. He had a bottle of water. P uh, Philip didn't take it and sprinkle it on him. So that's why I don't believe in pouring nor sprinkling. He found a body of water so he could do what? Go down in the water just as Jesus was down in the grave and came up and was raised new. He says that I believe in Jesus Christ as the son of God. Listen, friend, if people are coming to Jesus and are believing in Jesus, then there should be troubling in the water and we should be baptizing. I'm passionate about this, that we need more people saved. I thank God for the uh, eight people, I think, that have joined our church fellowship uh, between last month and this month. I thank God for them. God, I love you and I'm glad to have you. Now do this for me. Go and find somebody that doesn't know Jesus and tell them about the Savior so that they too can be saved. As God is moving among us and as God is helping us, then let us find ways to talk to more people about Jesus. Listen, I, I have a wonderful daughter and uh, she's so sweet and I love her greatly. Uh, and her mom and I have been discipling her and we've been talking to her, but I will not push her. She's the pastor's daughter, but I will not push her to get baptized. I want her to make that her choice. I'm not gonna tell her when to get baptized, but I want her to say, I believe in Jesus. I asked her often, I said, don't you love Jesus? And, and she'll often say, yes, I love Jesus. She said, well, I'm learning to love Jesus. And that's exactly what I want. If her mom and I do the right thing, we're creating a Christian home, we're discipling, we're using little moments here and there to explain this is what God requires of us. This is why we do what we do so that at some point, my Jesus will become her Jesus and she'll accept it on her own. And that's what happens here in this text that the Ethiopian eunuch. Can I ask you this? Are you using moments in your life to disciple those around you and to share your faith with them? And that's what Jesus wants us to do. He said, go into all the world preaching and teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, let me say just a word about that. So the Church of Christ says that... Um, it's, not, it's an invalid baptism if you weren't specifically baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, here's the problem with that. Again, it speaks to baptismal regeneration. Salvation does not come from what we do on the outside. It's all about what we believe on the inside. And when Jesus says baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, what he is saying is he is saying that we should accept the work of Calvary that has been put forward by the triunity of the Godhead. He speaks to God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and their role in the work of the salvation of every believer. God, the Father, in his providential plan, he set up the plan of salvation from Genesis, the time that uh, Genesis chapter three, the time that Adam sinned in the garden, he knew that dying on a tree or death because of a tree, life because his son died on a tree was going to be man's blessing and, and man's redemption. That was God's plan. Christ came and paid for the plan on the cross. He's the one that made the down payment and made it secure. God set up the plan, Christ paid for the plan, but then the Holy Spirit comes as preachers go out and teachers and, and those are you and I are Christians and we share the faith. The Holy Spirit helps us that all we got to do is, is, is set everything up. All we got to do is tell the story and it's the Holy Spirit that delivers it into man's heart. It is God that is the doctor that made the, the, the cure. It is Christ and his power that is the cure and it's the Holy Spirit that's the needle that injects it into men's hearts and gets them saved. All right. And so we, we thank God for the work of baptism that has been done in the in the life of the believer, in the life of the believer. But then the last and final thing, last and final thing, I told you there was a lot that I couldn't cover. And there's a lot I could cover even further uh, was the last portion where he says and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. This idea of discipleship is something that uh, is one of the most troubling things, I think, uh, for uh, the local New Testament churches, especially in North America. So during the days of great Billy Graham, uh, we, we saw so many salvations. We saw so many decisions and people were just getting saved left and right because we were focused on salvations. But I think one of the challenges is we got um, too lackadaisical and we became too comfortable with cultural Christianity that there was not a doubling down on this walking uh, along in discipleship. And so we created a culture uh, that um, we just assumed that people knew and we just assumed that people understood. But the fact is people, uh, it was quite clear, did not understand because their faith was not transferred and communicated uh, well into the life of uh, their families and to, uh, into creating believers uh, in, in successive and in further generations. And so let me say this, that the work of discipleship is, is a two-part work 
it's the work of the, the family and of the home. We're praying that their children growing up in Christian families, although the number of children growing up in Christian families and homes is taking a nosedive. But for those children that are growing up in Christian homes, those of you that have children in your home, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, I beg you, make it a place of discipleship where you are taking opportunities and times to pray together, where you're taking opportunities and times to break open the scripture and talk about the things of God together, where you're talking about morality, where you're talking about ethics. And then secondly, in the church, we should double down on creating disciple makers. Activity is one thing. Discipleship is another. And I think many churches got caught up in having activities and many people were happy doing busy work. But discipleship is something where you study the scriptures so that you know it for yourselves. I have staked my entire career on teaching the word of God line on line, verse on verse, not to make you smarter, not to make the people that listen to me more intellectually intelligent, even though intelligence is a part of it's the, one of the eyes in the name Spring Hill but so that you are disciples. What is a disciple? That's a student and follower of something. You could be a disciple of anything. You could be a disciple of a certain uh, form of medicine. You could be a disciple of a certain philosophy. Uh, when I say, when Jesus talks about being disciple, it is a disciple, a person that is a follower of himself and of his teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, let me share this with you. That doesn't come from just Sunday morning between 10 and noon that you become disciples. It is an everyday walk, everyday journey, and you have to always be working to grow as a disciple. One of the things I'm passionate about and we're working so hard to do is to provide more and more tools for you to daily learn what the word of God says. He says, teaching them to observe. That means to follow all the things not, not, not some things, but all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's amazing how many people want to pick and choose what they want to accept of Christ's teaching and out of the word and throw the others to the side. No, we have to, we have to be learning constantly, consistently, and, uh, and it's one of the things that we do. I, I'm closing with this, but let me implore you, let me beg you that if you're not a part, number one, of coming and studying the word of God together on Sunday mornings, please do that. If you're not a part of a small group or growth group, I beg you, it's not just a nice thing to do. It is critically important for you to learn and study the word of God with other believers in Christ. And there are so many other opportunities we have, but if, if we could just get people to do that one thing, people talk all the time about, you know, uh, who hasn't come back for the big church service. I'm less concerned about that. I'm more concerned with the number of people who are not connected in groups because it's in groups, in, in roles we celebrate, but in groups and in circles we grow. I'm most concerned about that. And it's a biblical, there is a biblical reason for us to be a part of a group. Acts chapter two, uh, verses 41 through 47, talk about how the, the local church developed. Uh, but I specifically want to grab 41 and 42. Then they gladly received his word and were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I used to say that I wanted Spring Hill to be at least 2,000 souls. Uh, we're in a very small uh, area, only 250,000 people in uh, Alachua County. It's a very, very small market, very, very small region. But the Bible says that 300,000 or, or 3,000, excuse me, were added to the church. And I believe our church can not only be 2,000, I believe we can be 3,000 if we'd all get on mission. But verse 42 was telling, it said, and they continued, continued. That means they kept on going steadfastly. That means they kept on going faithfully in the apostles doctrine. That word doctrine means teaching and in fellowship and koinonia, in partnership regarding the gospel and in breaking bread and in prayers. They were constantly uh, in groups together, constantly in study together to learn what God's word says. Friend, uh, I pray that our hearts will be on fire for sharing the gospel, spreading the gospel, but then also learning the gospel and teaching the gospel so that more people will come to Jesus and be baptized. 3,000 souls, he says, was added to the church. Now, most people don't understand the impact of that, but let me share this with you. Every one of those, each one of those numbers was a soul that was added to the kingdom. And every living soul that's a part of this Spring Hill Church Fellowship, I thank God for, because that's another soul that the devil can't have. That's another soul that the devil can't destroy. That's another life that has been changed by the power of the gospel. And that's what's most important to me. That's your son, that's your daughter, that's your grandson, granddaughter, your niece, your nephew. Those matter because Jesus wants everyone to know that he loves them. 
I love you. I pray that you'll be blessed. Walk in victory.